that occurred over the last 24 hours have kept her uh, from being here. Um, she's down in Madison on legislative business today. I plan on coming back. Um, last night, her and Al got a call about 12.30. Um, one of her employees and his girlfriend were stuck uh, on a county road near Tomahawk. Uh, the car was not working, so Mary and Al got out of bed and went to help him. And from what I understand, had to jumpstart their car about every six to eight miles all the way back to Medford. As you imagine, that, might, that takes a little while. Um, so did not get hardly any sleep last night. Um, she was down in Madison on business and did not feel that it was safe for her to be driving back. Um, so she's staying down there tonight. Um, she did have a prepared statement just in case she was late tonight. Um, she wanted me to read. Um, hello to all attending this evening. Uh, I hope to be back to Medford in time for the four or perhaps a little late. Uh, as you know, during campaign season, calendars don't always line up. Uh, I need to be in Madison for a very important meeting scheduled prior to this event. Um, I still have job duties, uh, even though it's campaign time. Uh, I'll be meeting with people about the mining issue. I hope you will understand as chairperson of the Jobs, Econ Economy, and Small Business Committee. This is extremely important not only to me, but to people throughout the state, and especially to those in the north. We need jobs in the state, and I'm hoping a mining operation will create many jobs. There will be a great deal of oversight in a mining operation. That is, that is, once all the state and federal departments involved give it their blessing and approve the necessary <coughs> permits. If I don't get back in time, I hope you understand my position. And if you have any questions, you always know that I'm available um, at home or in my office for any questions you might have. Uh, fortunately, I've been your state representative for 10 years now, and many of you know how I do my job. I always put you first and foremost in my decision making and try to do the best. I've enjoyed meeting so many new people and now all of my friends. On November 6th, I hope I will have your support so together we can continue moving the state forward. Thank you, Representative Mary Williams. <laughs> okay, uh, we got you. Okay. I'm Elizabeth Riley. Three weeks ago at the Stone Lake Cranberry Festival, I uh, ran into Representative Williams and she asked me why I was running for the assembly. And I thought that's a really good question and one that we should all be asking all of our elected politicians. Primarily, my answer boiled down to Act 10 and what it's done to the state of Wisconsin. I doubt that Representative Williams talked to any of you prior to, uh, about Act 10 prior to its passage. Because the most egregious part of Act 10 is how it was rammed through, specifically to avoid any discussion. I oppose Act 10 for a lot of reasons, but chief among them is its effect on many of my friends and neighbors who work in schools and in hospitals. Unlike bigger urban areas of the state, like Wausau, little communities like say, uh, Hayward, Ladysmith, and even Medford don't have corporations and banks and things like that that can be employers of and provide well-paying jobs um, for workers. Uh, our middle class in our districts is made up of those people, teachers, other public county and state employees, um, and nurses. Um, the wages of those people are what support the businesses in the middle class. And when those uh, wages and benefits are cut, the, the businesses in those areas get hurt as well. These workers are not big union bosses. They're Tom, your daughter's guidance counselor, or Barb, your grandson's third grade teacher, or Carol, the nurse who takes care of your grandfather at the VA. After years of education and training, they made the decision to be in those fields so that they could work in communities like ours. And they planned, they, they entered into their contracts in good faith, and they planned their lives and retirements around these. And when the state was hurting, they understood. And these people <coughs> said that they, um, they agreed to cuts in their pay and their benefits. But for Governor Walker and for Representative Williams, that wasn't enough. It was their way or the highway. 
no discussion, no matter how painful those effects were going to be on the people that she was sent to Madison to represent. Representative Williams at our last gathering spoke about how she listens to the people um, of the district, even when she's out to dinner with her family, and that's commendable. But were you consulted before Representative Williams voted along with Walker Republicans uh, to take shoreline development out of local control and put it in the hands of the people in Madison? Because she didn't talk to anyone in Sawyer County about it. Did she represent what is best for women of the district when she voted to, along with the Walker Republicans, to repeal the ability of women to sue in the event that they're discriminated against in the workplace? Was she standing for you when she decided to support Governor Walker's budget by voting to cut funding to Wisconsin's public schools by $1.6 billion? Did she stand for you when she voted to reward businesses with tax giveaways with no oversight? And let's face it, corporate welfare deserves at least the same amount of scrutiny that uh, social welfare programs get. And I doubt very much that Representative Williams would ever give away tax dollars to people for food or rent without some oversight. But she had no problem voting to just write checks to businesses with no plan in place to track the money in the new entity called WEDIC. Um, and was she really standing up for you when she signed an oath of secrecy <coughs> regarding the redrawing of the legislative districts in the state? I don't think she was. A representative is supposed to make herself available. She should both listen to and inform her constituents. She should work to secure the resources that her community needs in order to thrive. She needs to promote the free exchange of ideas among all kinds of people, and she must attend local meetings throughout the district. I will know and understand the 87th and be its voice because my job is to represent the district, not special interests. modifications to Act 10 or additional legislation to address our state's future fiscal soundness? Uh, that's a hard question for me to answer um, because I'm not sure a lot, um, how a lot of these, uh, these things work, having not served in public office before. I do believe that Act 10 needs to be modified. First of all, we have the um, collective bargaining that was stripped from public employees. And that right now is in the process of a very expensive court case, trying to figure out what's going to be the disposition of that. Um, the things in Act 10 that I would like to see changed are the fact that there were 110 civil service jobs that Governor Walker gave himself the power to fire those people and replace them at higher salaries with political appointees, who in many cases turned out to be donors to his campaign. I would also think that one of the things that needs to be changed about Act, about Act 10 is that it gives, uh, again, Governor Walker the authority to sell publicly held utilities um, for no bid contracts without the benefit of input from the Public Services or Public Utilities Commission. So I think those are things that definitely need to be changed. Governor Scott Walker recently announced that more than $100 million has been de deposited in the state's rainy day fund. This has drawn criticism from local governments that have seen state aid cuts in the recent years, most notably in education and transportation aids. How would you address these critics? I would say that they're right to be concerned about that. Um, first of all, I'm not even sure where that $128 million came from. Um, I know that the Walker administration and the Republicans in it would have us all believe that the, that the budget has been balanced, but they don't talk about restructuring any of the debt um, so that we are going to have to make payments down the line that we chose not to make this time, or that the Walker administration chose not to make at this time. I think that the cuts to our school districts were draconian in the least. $128 million is a lot of money, but it's not even going to begin to address um, 
those cuts plus the 30% that was cut to our technical schools. A rainy day fund is a nice thing to have, and I would certainly be open to putting money in it once we've met obligations that are really important. I agree with the critics of that rainy day fund. Um, when our schools are hurting as badly as they are to take $128 million and say, look at this great thing we've done, I don't think it is a great thing. Um, at the same time, the world population is growing. Rural communities in this portion of the state are fading away. What do you think is the biggest factor for the demographic switch, and how can it be reversed? Well, I think one of the reasons that people, especially most recently, are shying away from rural communities is the job situation. But it's sort of like a vicious cycle. I think the way I look at it is that people decide to settle in communities because they, there are certain things that are there for them. There are good schools. There is good health care that's accessible. There are jobs um, or places for them to work. The problem is when we start taking away those services from people, people aren't going to want to settle in those communities. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing here. Um, I know that when we moved to Hayward, because that's where I live with my family, we were very excited to move there. We had been in Milwaukee for a number of years and we're looking forward to moving to a rural area with our kids. They were little at the time. So we looked at the schools. My husband is a teacher, and, and he liked the schools and um, was hired to teach in the Hayward schools. And we just had a wonderful life there. Our children are happy they got to grow up there. Um, and they didn't have any trouble finding employment when they were kids. But I have seen businesses start to fall off in that area because the people that support those businesses, the teachers, the snow plow drivers, and people like that, haven't been able to have a discretionary income the way they did before. So that's one of the reasons why people are leaving the communities. If you have the infrastructure, like the schools and healthcare and, and things like that, people will come to those areas to live and then they will start new businesses. Um, the veterinary clinic down the street or the restaurant down the other street. There are plenty of opportunities for true small business. And I know that a lot of people refer to small business as anything with under 500 employees, but that's not the case in these small towns. And it really, um, other than a few, uh, Weather Shield here, and I, so I know that there are some, but certainly not in Ladysmith and not in Hayward. You don't see these businesses that hire uh, 500 employees. These are small businesses that will hire five to 10 people in the community and then pay them a living wage. And that's the other thing, too, is we have to make sure that we can pay our people a living wage. It has been said that for progress to be made on critical issues, elected officials should work across the aisle and attempt to minimize political party partisanship. What is your opinion regarding the issue of partisanship? I think it's a cancer. Honestly, I'm a nurse, and I, I don't use that term lightly. I think it's a cancer in the state of Wisconsin. And it never used to be this way. Even back when um, Tommy Thompson was government, governor, people worked together. Uh, when Jim Doyle was governor, people worked together. They may not have liked what other people did, but they worked together. Suddenly, the Walker administration came in, <coughs> and with Act 10, in six days, ruined 50 years of bipartisanship. 50 years of collective bargaining that people had, in six days, gone. And it divided families in the community, and I know because it divided my own family. It took people who worked for the private sector for probably modest wages, and, and the Walker administration told those people, oh, you know, you've really been suffering, and you know why? It's these guys over here, these public employees, they're the ones taking all your money. I used to do the same thing when I was a little kid to my sisters, if I got bored or whatever. I'd pick a fight between the two of them and then just kind of sit back and wait until uh, my mom stepped in to settle the argument. 
You don't pick fights with people like that. You don't divide people like that. You work together, and I have not seen that in this administration. It has been unprecedented. To address it, I would do what I do with my patients. Sorry, I, I uh, got, got carried away there for a minute. Um, when I, especially when I was doing home health nursing, I might go into somebody's house and I'd have a whole list of orders that the physician gave saying you're gonna do this, this, and this. I'd walk into the house and think, these people don't even have running water. There is no way I'm gonna be able to do all these things that the physician order is. So what I'm gonna do is talk to the patient and ask her, what is important to you? What do you see as optimum functioning for you? And then we go from there. And I call the physician and say, this is what she can do. These are things that aren't going to happen. This is what can happen. And then we work together. And it's just like that with anything. You listen. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us this evening. And uh, uh, you're welcome to stay for the remainder and hang around if anybody would like to come forward. Um, you're an uh, opponent uh, for the physician uh, uh, emailed me this afternoon that due to a prior uh, or something that came up was going to be unable to attend. So um, do you want to take the time to okay. tell us about yourself? Okay. Um, well, good evening to everybody. And I'd like to thank the Star News and the radio station for the opportunity to uh, introduce myself as a candidate for the Registered Needs Office. And to start out with, I've been in the Registered Deeds Office for over 29 years. I was appointed the Chief Deputy in 1983 and have had that position since that time. Um, the Registered Deeds Office, we record history in our office every day. And <coughs> it's the place that your real estate records, the birth, death, and marriage records are filed. Um, the records are kept in the Registered Deeds Office that we have now, go back to 1875. And if you look at that, that means that those, some of those records we have are over 135 years old. The Registered Deeds Office, we record your real estate records, your mortgages, easements, and many other documents affecting title to real estate. And why are those in records so important? They're used every day by attorneys, other county departments, abstractors, surveyors, financial institutions, and citizens. The real estate records are used to find legal ownership of property and locate the legal descriptions or boundaries of parcels of land. The records can also be used to determine if there are liens or encumbrances on property, which protects the citizens when they are going to purchase a parcel of land to be aware if those liens or encumbrances exist on those parcels. The birth, death, and marriage records, your vital records, are used for entry into schools, driver's licenses, employment, obtaining a passport, and genealogists use those records when researching their family histories. Being in the office for the only time that I have been there, I am familiar with all the software that we use in the county at the county level and also the statewide systems that we're required to use in our office. I have um, the experience of working with legal descriptions and determining uh, legal descriptions of property. And I'm also familiar with the statutes that govern our office. We are a constitutional office of, of the state of Wisconsin, so we are required to know those statutes and how they affect our office and the citizens of our county. Some of you might be familiar with me for um, our, my community service. I am active in the historical society and the genealogical society for Taylor County. And I volunteer for both of those groups. And I've also been a lifelong citizen of Taylor County. I was raised in the town of Little Black and grew up there. And I have seven brothers and sisters, so I have a large family. And I'm also really involved with the history part of our records. I find that to be something that is very interesting and I can use my abilities that I have in the office to work with the public with those historical records. And I just would like everybody to know that I've always enjoyed being of service to the public, and I would very much be honored to continue to serve the public as the Register of Peace. Thank you very much. Oh, flip to see who goes first. 
strategies for maximizing revenues and collections. In 2013, I'll receive my certification as a Wisconsin Municipal Treasurer. For the past 16 years, I've been a tax assistant in the Real Property Listers Office at the Taylor County Courthouse. As part of my job duties, I maintain and balance assessment roles for 27 townships in the county, which encompass roughly 26,000 parcels. Furthermore, I provide assistance to all municipal clerks and treasurers regarding mill rate calculations, real estate and personal property tax payments, and guidance on state mandated forms. I work with assessors, realtors, abstractors, lending institutions, surveyors, county and state personnel, and the public in terms of providing them with accurate information. Public service has always, always been an important part of my life. With my job experience, education, and determination to get the job done, I am the best candidate for the position. Running for office this year has been a truly phenomenal experience for me. Across the county, people took time to invite me into their homes to share coffee and just visit. Without a doubt, we live in a truly generous, compassionate, and very thoughtful community. I would like to thank everyone across the county for taking time to get to know me. I'm Mary Quanti, and I'm asking for your support on November 6th. Thank you. First off, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight and for supporting all of your local candidates. Um, I'm Sarah Holtz. I've been your county treasurer for the past two years. Um, I was Holloway's treasurer, local treasurer, for 11 years. Um, we also, out in Holloway, have a ball club. Always Sluggers. I've been the treasurer for that for the past 10 years. I'm still currently the treasurer. Um, I was born and raised out in Holloway on a farm. My parents are Gina Bonnie Adams. Um, I've been married to my husband Brian also for 22 years. Um, I have three children, two boys that are in college, and a daughter that's a stay-at-home mom. And I have three grandbabies, all under the age of three. <laughs> so they keep me busy. Um, growing up on a farm. I learned the value of a dollar. And in those pe the past two years, I have invested your money wisely, and I've tried to put it in the most safe, secure places that I can. Um, some of the duties that are involved in the treasures is more than just collecting taxes. Um, we 
receipt, all revenue that comes in from all the different departments in the county. They all have to be receipted um, with their own individual codes. They have to be put in entered in accurately. Um, our accounts have to be monitored daily. Money has to be moved in and out um, as needed. You know, when different situations come up, they need to be paid. Uh, we do have CDs through the county, and I was told by one of the local bankers that I was the first treasurer that she had ever had that had haggled with her for interest rates. She says, I've never had that. And I said, well, that's, I guess, something I got from my father. And he's, you know, he says, why settle? He says, if you can get better, go for it. And I've done that. I've haggled, and I've gotten the better interest rates. Um, so I'm looking out for your money. Um, some of the different things that we also do, you know, I, we do daily reports, um, daily deposits, anything that comes in, um, phone calls that come in and they ask for, you know, delinquent amounts. Um, I do settlements with the 27 municipalities. Um, we do two different settlements, one in um, January and one in February. Uh, we also do settlements, I do settlements with the state and with the schools. There is lots of deadlines that have to be made, have to be met, I should say. Um, and you know, you have to keep on top of things. You have to be very organized and you know, very accurate with what you do. Um, we also do the tax due process, which isn't anything that I like to do, but it is a part of the job. Um, and then also, as a treasurer, I am the department head for four county employees, and Mary has being one of them. Um, I have very knowledgeable employees, um, anybody that has any questions, they can come up to any of our offices and like I said, they, you know, I have wonderful people that I work with, they, if they can't answer it, we do also have other departments in the courthouse, we all work together um, to get the job done and answer questions that you may have. Three years ago when I first ran for treasurer, my um, motto was honesty, accuracy, and reliability. Vote for me and you'll get all three. And I believe I've given you all three of those in the past two years and I would ask if I could continue to have your support and it would be an honor if you would support me on November 6th as county treasurer.